Welcome back to Mississippi Stories. Today's uh, episode is about a new documentary that's coming out, Look Away, Look Away. It is about the battle to change the state flag in Mississippi. It's a battle that many of us have been in the middle of for the last few years, particularly in since the last five has been really uh, interesting. And the documentary, of course, is by Patrick O'Connor. He's with us. He's the director and the writer of it. And I'm going to read the bio because it's a lot of good stuff in it. Prior to completing Look Away, Look Away, Patrick's most recent documentary film, The Invisible Patients, had its national PBS broadcast premiere on America Reframed in 2018. The film also screened at the Heartland, uh, Chicago International Social change and indie film festivals, as well as at universities and national conferences on bioethics and healthcare. His feature film screenwriting credits included Ricochet River, 2001, starring Kate Hudson, and the independent feature Sacred Hearts, 1995, which he also directed. Sacred Hearts premiered at the Boston Film Festival and subsequently played at the Fort Lauderdale uh, awarded Best First Feature, Palm Springs, New Haven, and Phoenix Film Festivals, as well as the Lincoln Center in New York. His first screenplay, Zoo, was purchased by Steven Spielberg's Amblin Entertainment. Congratulations. Patrick graduated from Santa Clara University with a BA in English, and he received an MFA in Creative Writing Fiction from the University of Arkansas. He lives in Pass Christian, Mississippi, with his wife, and writer, Margaret McMullen, who I had the pleasure of getting to know when I interviewed her for her book, Where the Angels Lived, uh, which is a fantastic book, really enjoyed, and I've gotten to know you. I ran into y'all down at Pass Christian when I spoke down there, so it's very good to get to talk to you today. Mm -hmm. no, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Hey, I, and um, yeah, I hope I didn't butcher too much of that. You know, I'm still hooked on phonics, but I, I'm still working. <laughs> Some of that was in the Wayback Machine. I've yes. thought about some of that stuff for a long time. I know you start you start looking back and you're like, oh, I did something in 2001, and you realize, oh my gosh, that was a while back. I know, I know for sure. It's crazy. Um, first of all, look away, look away is very powerful. I just finished watching it. I had actually wanted to come into this totally fresh after watching it, and uh, it was incredibly powerful. Of course, the the whole change the state flag movement here in Mississippi has been one that's been, you know, obviously controversial because you have two sides that are very entrenched in their beliefs and, and they're talking past each other. And it's been, one thing I've discovered about Mississippi in my quarter of a century living here is like you, I, I ain't from around here, I guess you could say, because I, mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm a Yankee, I'm from Atlanta. Um, as, as one lady actually told me that in a speech and I went, but Sherman burned my town down too. So, you know, I should get some credit. But the one thing I love, we love shiny objects. We love to argue about emotional things and not logical things sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so there's always been so much emotion in this fight. And I remember 2001 being in the middle of it with, with some of the cartoons I did that there was, you know, one side was arguing emotionally and the other was logically. And you're never going to win that argument if you're going to come at it logically. What made you decide to take on this project now? Well, it's a, there were a couple of reasons. One was, you know, we had we moved down to Pass Christian, moved to Mississippi in um, in 2015, shortly after Dylan Roof murdered those fo those folks in, yeah. in Charleston, and this this battle was just brewing up all around me. So I was, you know, was watching the SCV have rallies up in Jackson, sort of promoting heritage and Sharon's Brown organization, the Flag for All Mississippians was having their events. And I was just watching this sort of two sides debate develop. And the more I sort of thought about it and sort of discovered that Mississippi was the last of the original Confederate states to still have a Confederate battle flag in its, in its uh, state flag, I thought this is, this is going to be a, a fascinating uh, uh, story. And I just thought the best way to tell it would be to try to, to get to know people on both sides of it and follow it wherever it went. I had no idea it was going to go on for five years, um, but the impulse was to, you know, try to try to document what was what was happening here at that time. Right. In, in late in late 2015, so we started shooting in in early 2016. Oh wow! Yeah. I, to your credit, I mean, there was one scene where you're interviewing a. a, a guy a flag supporter named tim and he said i hope you present both sides fairly and let people make up their mind and to your credit i think you did a pretty good job doing that um mm -hmm. how hard was that i mean 
when you walked in there and you, you, you know, you, you were not from the South originally, you, you do not drop your G's and say y'all and, and everything naturally. When you walk in there with a film camera, how are you received? Oh, and almost entirely welcomed. Um, in, in almost every case, I had a, a connection or a contact with somebody who sort of prearranged to have me there. Yeah. So in the case of that scene with Tim, we were at something called the Civil War Relic Show in Brandon, Mississippi. Which I have to admit, that looked really cool. I mean, I, loving history. I mean, I, I was kind of geeking out at some of the it, stuff they had in there. It was fascinating. And one of the most interesting parts of that, and, and I'm going to try to avoid talking about stuff that's not in the film. Right. Um, you know, we shot over 350 hours of footage wow. over the course of these five years, which if you think about that. But which means you're yeah. editing for nearly that long, too. Right. Yeah. So it's tons of editing and there's an, an enormous amount of really good material that just didn't make the cut. But in that particular day um, at that Civil War Relic show, I spent a lot of time with the one member of the Sons of Union soldiers who was there. Really? This guy who had a booth and he was next to a Sons of Confederate Veterans guy. And he was there kind of like the way you described. He was there because the history fascinates him. Yeah. And I talked to him a little bit about the flag debate. And he was like, you know, his position was, you know, we fought back then. The flag represents something to these folks. Leave it alone. You know, so that that was his position yeah. as a Yankee. He was, I think, from Pennsylvania, who was at the Civil War Relic Show. But to, to answer your question is I was welcomed and people would talk to me, you know, fairly freely. And, I, and like I say in the film, I told everybody to the degree that I was able to, was like, I'm not out here to, to, to get anybody or to judge anybody or make right. a biased film. I want to just, I just want to understand why you feel the way you feel. And there were very few situations where I walked into a, um, you know, like a, a heritage event where, you know, anybody who listens to me talk will know I'm not from around here and I'm not Southern. But for the most part, I think people just want their story to be told. Right. And I was, you know, trying to be, you know, sort of a, a vessel for that. Tell me what you think. Um, tell me why you, you think the way you think. Tell me why you're out here fighting to preserve the state flag. And um, that, that was kind of it. And also, I, it was not easy to do. I mean, I would go over the course of a weekend, I would go to a Confederate heritage rally in Tupelo and the next day be at a, you know, take it down rally in Ocean Springs. And it was, just like it, yeah. it was just psychic whiplash. Yeah. I mean, it's like they were, they were, it felt like two different countries in a, in a lot of ways, which struck me that happened to me all the time. I'd be heading somewhere thinking, okay, these, these folks have a different concept of kind of who they are and where they fit in the world than the people I just left, you know, the, the day before. So that's something that, um, really struck me after a while was this this sort of like you said in, in, when we first started talking this there's this talking a, a, across right past each other right that is really kind of frustrating even one of the first things that that occurred to me in this while making the film was that there is no dialogue there's one rally and then there's another rally there's i think you use talking points there's people just arguing back and forth but there's very little conversation and the, I think it's the um, Mississippi Humanities Council had a panel discussion on the flag at Hall and Mal's. Yeah. And, and I went there to shoot it and I thought, okay, now we're gonna get some dialogue. But they just, they all, the people on the panel all talked to the audience. They never, they never addressed each yeah. other's thoughts. It just, didn't ha it just didn't happen. And then later, the same thing, there's a scene in the film at USM, there's a panel discussion um, that goes sideways very quickly but they don't talk to each other. They're making a point to an audience and the audience is receiving it, but there's very little interaction between them, which I think is, um, it's part of the reason why it's, it's, it's such a difficult issue to solve. Well, you know, I mean, if you look at where we've been in the last year with the pandemic and where mm -hmm. we've been in the last four years with politics per se, in a way, the flag vote was kind of a canary in the coal mine for where we are as a country. Because, I mean, these issues are pretty much nationwide. It's not just Mississippi. This is the, these are issues that we're fighting nationwide. But it's it's almost like the, the conversations in the documentary kind of reminded me of what I see on Facebook every day, whether it's about the vaccine or the virus or about Donald Trump or about Joe Biden or, or anything else. It's just people 
get out there and they tell, they talk about what they've heard and then, but they're not going to listen to what anybody else has to say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it's the, another interesting, uh, you know, and I don't know how to explain this, but it's a, a very political question. Yeah. The, the folks who are in support of the flag are all, you know, and I, I don't want to mischaracterize folks, but they're very conservative, uh, mostly Republicans, very many, you know, Trump supporters, and the folks yeah. who are trying to change the flag, liberal, mostly Democrats, um, it's 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 all tied up together. Um, this sort of tribal, this sort of tribalism, this tribal feel to it. Um, I, I think I maybe met one uh, Democrat in this whole process. Somebody who told me he was a Democrat who was at a Confederate Heritage rally, you know, to, to you know to save the flag. Yeah, that's didn't happen, it didn't happen very often. But like I say, I don't like I don't want to generalize too much because I'm sure, you know, there are exceptions to that. But it's. Um, it's, all these issues are rolled together in a way. Yeah, it is interesting. So, I mean, it basically you had folks over here and over here driving the conversation. And there's a bunch of people, I guess, right here. I don't know how many people are in the middle that, and, and I'm not going to skip ahead to the end of the story, but that mm -hmm. was at the end of the day, I think that is what ended up tipping the whole thing in the process. But I, I mean, I'll go back to 2001. And I thought it was interesting. You brought up in 1993 about the NAACP suing the state you know, to remove the flag for, for obvious reasons. And I, I had not forgotten about that, but that was when the fact that the flag was not the official state flag kind of came out. And that's what gave birth to 2001 on that referendum that, that Musgrove brought up, which I, I think that partially cost him, you know, politically, the mm -hmm. flag vote in Mississippi. So if you go, the start of the documentary starts with, obviously, with, with Dylan Roos massacre and brutal murder mm -hmm. going into the church and Nikki Haley took down the flag. Lindsey Graham supported taking down the flag. Neither one of them seemed to suffer anything politically. Why is South Carolina, why was that so much different than it never got any traction here in Mississippi at that time? Uh, that's a great question. I don't, I mean, for one, it's the immediacy, I think. I mean, those folks are in South Carolina and we're feeling yeah. you know, very closely that that was, you know, that was their um, you know, that was their family that was murdered. I mean, collectively in, in that right. area of South Carolina. And I just kind of feel like Mississippi is maybe far enough away that, you know, not enough people really felt it. Um, it certainly stirred up a lot of passion and a lot of energy to remove the flag. Yeah. Um, I mean, in, in those early months in, in 2016, if I had to make a prediction, I would have guessed that it would have come down yeah. because there was so much pressure. I mean, every famous person from Mississippi was signing letters to the editor in the, in the newspapers. Every historian at the universities in Mississippi was saying, you gotta change that flag. All the universities took the flag down, you know, yeah. cities and counties all over the state were taking it down. I thought there's, there's no way they're gonna withstand this pressure. That's, it's, that's what I was thinking was gonna happen. But over time, it just, you know, the, the sort of, the, 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 the ways that the flag could come down, and that's sort of the way I was thinking about the story it, making the film, was there were windows of opportunity or sort of story thread where the flag could change. There's a legislative, I, mean, I spent a lot of time with the legislature, yeah. and there were bills being passed on both sides. There was no, I mean, Philip Gunn wouldn't let anything out of committee, so nobody would be forced to vote on it, and the governor wasn't going to do anything, so the legislative efforts went on for years, but came to naught. There was, Carlos Moore had these lawsuits where he was suing the governor over the state flag. And I spent a lot of time with Carlos on the film, but all of those just ran under roadblocks where they just kept getting dismissed. So that thread didn't go anywhere. Um, the grassroots efforts, early on, both sides were trying to um, get enough signatures to get it on a referendum, a statewide vote. They both failed. You know, neither side could get enough signatures to make anything happen. So it's just all of these efforts to change the flag just sort of ran out of steam and none of them were able to make it happen. I mean, we can get, maybe we can talk about the end of the film a little bit later, but um, I made a version of the film that we finished in April of last year where the story was unresolved. Yeah. We had, we had a cut finished. And we were ready to go into like the series post-production with, with a film where it was an unresolved story. 
and that was a certain kind of film, a certain kind of ending. And then, you know, you know what happened and the whole thing blew back open again. And then the postscript, you know, after yeah, the, exactly. yeah, it, it really is. And it, 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 I have to say that, you know, 2001, the day of the flag vote, I had been getting a lot of really angry phone calls through the day. And that's fine. I mean, that doesn't bother me. But mm -hmm. uh, my doctor called me at 530 in the afternoon and said, oh, you've got cancer. And so, I mean, I started laughing and he's like, why are you laughing? I said, this is the nicest call I've had all day. Thank you. Oh, you I mean, you got it. a call that you actually had cancer. Yeah, I actually was diagnosed with cancer on that day. And that so, was the good news. That was the good news, you know, but but it was one of those things that when I remember being wheeled into surgery, literally two days later, I was thinking, I probably will not see this thing change in my lifetime just because wow. I it was so in concrete on that. But But you touched on something, even though nothing was going to happen politically, you know, I remember at one point, I guess, when right after what, and we'll talk about George Floyd in a little bit too, but I mean, right after that point, I remember driving into work and I had an 18 mile commute. I counted 31 American flags and not a single state flag. It's like the flag just kind of evaporated organic. That, that, that happened here too. We have a neighbor, um, someone who lives a few blocks up the road, um, they, they took that state flag, they had a state flag up, it came down sometime after the George Floyd murder. I mean, I think, I think some people, it read that that resonated with them for some reason. And I, you know, I, I agree, you started seeing fewer state flags up after that before there was any official, you know, reason to take it down. I, I Clay Moss, the vexologist that you interviewed in the movie, I, I'd, I'd really like to sit down and, and, and have a beer with this guy, you know, <laughs> no. It's like, I was just fascinated. Now, this is a good flag. And he shows the yellow flag. He said, but the thing is, you know, it's amazing how powerful symbols truly are. And you watch your movie and you see, so you get the same thing. You've got a cross, the St. Andrew's cross. You've got the stars on 13 stars. You've got the colors of the American thing. And it totally means something totally different to two groups of people like that. It's just yeah. incredible. Yeah. Um, talk about Clay a little bit on that, he, you know, because he was like, it, it was like he was predicting the, the, the when, when we did vote on a new flag, he was predicting, you know, a lot of the complaints I heard about the flag we ended up getting. It needs to be simple. It needs to be easy on that a little bit. How did you find Clay? Um, I maybe found him through, it's possible I met him through Lauren Stemmes. Yeah. Um, I think she may have had some connection with Clay just because of his vexillology background. Yeah. Um, and there may be also been a, another connection. There's a gentleman named Ted Kay who wrote a book called Good Flag, Good Flag, Bad Flag. He's like, yeah, that's yeah. He's like the national vexillologist. Um, and Lauren had a relationship with him. And now I, I know him a little bit now, too. But um, I, I think, you no, know, I reached out to Clay and, and told him the sort of the same thing. I'm trying to make a film about the flag. And I would love to get your take just from a, you know, a vexillology point of view. Yeah. Um, but Clay also has a lot of, I mean, he's a Mississippian and has a lot of his own sort of, uh, you know, feelings about things, but he took it, he looked at it, and, the, and most of the content that we use of, of the time I spent with Clay was really specifically about design. Yeah. And um, and, and I, I love spending time with Clay, and it was fun to watch him via, like, these Zoom meetings where he was trying to wrangle the design process with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're putting words on it and they're putting details on it. And I could just sort of watch, watch Clay think, you know, you shouldn't be putting <laughs> words on it. You shouldn't be putting flowers on it. It should be geometric shapes arranged in such a way that they, you know, so that's his approach. But, you know, I give Clay a lot of credit for, you know, managing that process to the degree that he did. I don't think he managed it, but he, he advised them and he gave them his, his best advice and, and, you know, that's a role that he plays in the state. Um, where he he is the vexillologist that everyone goes to when they have flag issues. You know, I, I grew up in the South and I grew up seven miles away from Kennesaw National Battlefield in Atlanta. And, you know, I mean, a lot of what I heard were things that I was taught in school, you know, a lot mm -hmm. of the, the viewpoints on everything. And, you know, over time, you know, you just kind of have to wonder how long will it take for some, like, for instance, the, the gentleman that you had in Forrest, who was there cleaning up the, the, the graveyard. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was honestly, he was doing that out of pure love and passion for the people that were buried underneath those headstones on that. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. And it, it just, 
it was amazing. And I think toward the end of the film, you actually made that point that, you know, even though there is a and no pun, no, this isn't necessarily race, but the black and white views of the flag, there's there is actually a little bit of gray in the middle, too, isn't there? Yeah, oh, I definitely think so. And, you know, you're asking, did you ask him like what it what it will take to change? Yeah, what well, I mean, seriously, I mean, how do you think uh, over time, you know? You know, I, I don't know the answer to that, but I think, you know, the question that interests me more is the sense of identity. Yeah. And, you know, you said education, you know, you went to school and you were taught certain things. And I think that's, that's true throughout the South. You go to school and you're taught certain things, but for other folks, it's, it goes beyond what you're taught in school. It's, it's what you're taught in your family yeah. and what your, what your grandparents talked about. And for a lot of these folks, and there's, again, I apologize, there's a scene that's not in the film, but I met with a gentleman who um, showed me the family Bible that belonged to his ancestor who fought in the Civil War. And he's flipping yeah. through it, and it's just like he's got this, this, this physical object in his hand that's a direct connection to his family. Yeah. And for, for folks for whom that was important in their, in their upbringing, that becomes sort of who they are. And it, I just don't think you, you're going to get much traction telling somebody who you are is wrong. Yeah. You know, you're wrong to feel the way you feel about, you know, your identity. And I think that's, that's true on both sides. You know, somebody who has a, a, an ancestry, you know, that involves slavery or subjugation during Jim, Jim Crow to tell them, oh, you know, why are you focusing on that? It, it's like, it's the same problem that, you know, people, it's about who you are. Right. And that's sort of one of the conclusions, I guess, if that's a conclusion, it's definitely not earth shattering by any means, but it's it, it's part of the reason why it's such an intractable problem is because you're you're making people. Uh, get on the yeah, say, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Oh, no, I said you're making people get on the defensive about their people and so exactly, forth. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So it, it, identity is a, a big part of why I think this this issue just it's not going to go away, but. I honestly think that the more people sort of understand why one side or the other feels the way they do, right? You know, maybe that dials down the temperature a little bit, and 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 you can start asking different questions. Yeah, the, Whitman has a great quote that says, um, "Be curious, not judgmental." Yeah, you know, I actually a, a couple of weeks ago I watched an interview, last and I think I think it was with uh, with Tate Taylor. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And you've got a little sign in your, yeah, your right on your table. Yeah, yeah, I thought, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I think there's, you know, you talk about the education you get too. But I mean, it's for me, and one of the things I've I've always enjoyed, and I mean, I, I mean, I am Southerner. I've lived here my whole life, but but two years. But I mean, I always like talking to people, and always like hearing their point of view and listening why thing. You know, and the flag belt was kind of that way too. You know, I like to hear why people love it. I like to hear why people hate it. And mm -hmm. you know, at the end of the day, it, it is a symbol that represents the state of Mississippi, and it doesn't necessarily. If it didn't represent all of the state, then I thought, well, maybe you know, there should be something done about it. But you're right. I think that the empathy and and does take down the temperature. And when I, I interviewed Lawrence of uh, Stennis. Um, on the radio, it was sort of a radio show, okay. when, right in the peak of when everything was going uh, right. really big. And you you interview her and really, I mean, really uh, talk to her a, a while in, in the documentary on that. And, you know, she loves her grandfather. She doesn't mm -hmm. condone everything he did, but she still loves her grandfather. And, you know, that was part of the narrative because it's like, oh, here's the Stennis flag and here's, you know, but it's it's representing, but that turned really fast. It <laughs> On, on that and she just kind of backed out of the fight but she yeah. she, was, she was always really good when she I remember she talking to me she said I, when I go to rallies I don't get in people's face and I don't tell them they're wrong I tell mm -hmm. them why this is good for the state of Mississippi and yeah. there for a while that worked yeah I mean I, I there was a, there was quite a while where I was I, I I had a feeling that 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 her flag would be what eventually you know became the state flag yeah and partially because you know her, her approach what her approach was you know as bipartisan as it could be she was always trying to bring people together and her her her, her sort of motto was put it up not take yeah. it down it wasn't about taking something from people and yeah. i you know i spent a lot of time with lauren and um you know I, I thought that her approach was really something that could work but 
again, you know, and you know, maybe if enough time had passed, if you know, if if the George Floyd murder hadn't happened and this debate kept going on, that's you know, that maybe could have been what happened. Yeah. Um, but you're right; it turned pretty quickly. Oh, and Lenore, something that was really out of her out of her control. Yeah, and I I felt bad for her. I really did on that because she'd put so much energy into it. Um, that you know, you talk about taking things away, and that was one thing that I heard a lot in 2001, and I heard a lot of people on the documentary saying that too. They mm -hmm. feel like that there it's there's a grievance out there that, that something that's theirs that means a lot to them is being taken away, which. It, once again, a symbol may represent something larger in their lives. Mm -hmm. You know that what did you're saying there? Part of this process over the years is we would have, um, like we we'd have a, a cut, you know, a rough cut of the film. Yeah, and we would show it to people like a small group of other filmmakers or editors to try to get their feedback. You know, just like what's working, what's not working. And there were a couple different times, and these are mostly. Um, people up in the Chicago area, my editor, one of the editors is from yeah. Chicago and I'm from Chicago originally. And they'd watch this cut of the film that was similar to what you've seen in, in a sense. And one of the first responses, this is from a, you know, someone from Chicago is, I don't get what they feel they're, they're losing. I don't understand it. Yeah. And that made me feel in a way it was like, okay, then the film's not working because I want you to feel what they're losing i want you yeah. to understand why this is important to them and that to me that sort of made just made me realize that again it, it's part of the the different identities they if you don't understand why your the, the cultural and ancestral connections to you know the confederacy and the civil war mm -hmm. if you don't understand that you're not going to understand why they're why they're upset and, and, and so what I've tried to do with the film is, is, you know, let people say enough and do enough so that you understand why this is important to them and why they feel like if that flag changes, they are losing something. You don't have to agree with them. Right. But, you know, it's an, it's an emotional truth. They, they, there's a reason they feel that way. Yeah. So, and I think the documentary did a really good job doing that. I think you did figure out how to fix it. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I would hope. I mean, I, I've, I've tried. Yeah. And this is something that's kept me up at night for years. It's like I want yeah. people to feel like they've been well represented uh, on both sides of it, and that they've that they've been you know treated fairly, and that people you know can watch the film and at least have a better understanding of why they feel the way they do on, on either side of it. Well, speaking of that, I know we've got a, a small clip that I'm going to try to do through Zoom Magic to show a little bit of the documentary. So uh, I'm not guaranteeing this is going to work, but we're going to try it. But I think you're, you, in this segment here, it's about four minutes long. It does set up both sides' point of view on this. So here mm -hmm. we go. So modern technology is wonderful. For this Yankee nation, I do not give a damn. For a ginner, I'd only wish we'd won. Ain't us any pardon for anything I've done. Look, this state flag issue never would have been brought back up if it wasn't for what happened on June the 17th in Charleston, South Carolina. They want you to believe that that flag grew hands and legs, came down that pole, walked in that church and killed those people. It was a human being that did that, not a flag. <laughs> Open your mouth. Open your mouth. When you keep them, your mouth open, it uh, does something with the concussion. Every flag has its history. It has its pride and dark parts. We want to talk about dark parts. You know, we can mention how slavery was brought in under the U.S. flag. There's videos of this one organization marching down, I believe it's Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C., and they're only flying the U.S. flag. Why not be offended because of that flag? You know, if we're going to be offended by everything, every negative part of our history, we have to get rid of everything. Tell you what, you start messing with something that 
is dear to our heart, like our heritage, then you got a fight on your hands. And uh, that's just like, you know, you're messing with family when you start messing with that. If you say you're fighting for your heritage, well, your heritage was based on money and power. And the only way you could get money and power here in the South is if you kept a disenfranchised people enslaved. Plain and simple. I always knew what the Confederate emblem meant to us as um, African Americans, but. What, can you tell me what it always meant to you? Hatred, lynchings, beatings. Poverty, white supremacy is just a disgusting emblem. I feel that way because I live it. that this whole flag and shit is really a serious, serious issue. Yeah. Yes. And you have to look beyond the fact that some people say, oh, it's just a rag. Mm -hmm. But it's not just a rag. That's right. It, 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 it represents inequality. Right. It represents hatred. And the flag was always present, like it was in South Carolina, when those nine people were innocently shot. We gotta understand the flag represents the flu that we have. And when you have flu, you have symptoms, you have fever, you have coughing, you have sneezing, and we have all of these, we have all the signs of the flu of Mississippi. And in 2016, every bill that was passed was against poor folk and against black folk. 335,000 people in this state still don't have Medicaid, still don't have access, and nobody said anything about it. But that flag says, we don't care. Yeah. Yeah. Mississippi continues to say, we're going to let this flag fly, and we're going to show the world that we're still Mississippi. But I want to tell you, Mississippi, the flag is going to come down. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of sons of Confederate veterans and members of the KKK uh, say that they are Christians. I just, it is my hope and my desire that God will touch them to portray Christianity. How do you change the heart of a man? Uh, the law may not change the hearts of men. It can and it does change the habits of men. When you begin to change the habits of men, pretty soon the attitudes will be changed. Pretty soon the hearts will be changed. My mother, she fought for welfare rights for women. They hosed her down with hoses. She still had the bite marks on her leg from the dog. And she also went to jail and I was like, you know, that's my mama. Why? Why? I mean, she's the sweetest person on earth. Why would somebody do that to her? It was appalling. When the news I'm came on cancel out about of that the shooting, okay. mama said that don't make no goddamn sense. That um, pretty powerfully sums it up. Yeah, it, that's that's folks seeing a symbol and seeing something completely different. Yeah. Yeah, and having, it does. having reasons for feeling that way. And, and you know, I mean, whether, you know, they both, the passion behind the, what they, their belief was so strong, incredibly strong on that. Um, but yeah, no, and, and you do a good job with, like you said, with the documentary, being able to get that out there and, and tell a little bit. And you talked about earlier how you had the, you know, you had a certain ending in mind and, and it's so hard when you're doing a documentary about history, unless you have a crystal ball uh, that you know how it's going to turn out. 
I don't think anybody, I mean, here we were, the virus hit about a year ago today, uh, literally like Toto pulls the curtain back on everything and everyone, our, our institutions, our government, we get to see what works, we don't get to see what works. There had already been a series of um, racial incidents that had pretty much upset the, the, the nation just because you're watching it going, I can't believe this is happening in 2020, you know, mm -hmm. and then George Floyd happens. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even though in, in South Carolina that made the change there because that was their family and that was their people, George Floyd, this was it was such a just uh, like a hydrogen bomb going off mm -hmm. and a fact that you could feel it far away. Yeah. Um, things started moving really fast here at Mississippi to change the flag. Yeah, it really did. And, and, you know, I don't know if I can articulate what what exactly it was about the George Floyd murder that resonated differently with people here. I, I think there also might be a cumulative effect. Yeah, it's like, oh, no, not again. You know, right. you know, don't make us go through this again. Um, that was the feeling I kind of had. Um, and it took me a long time to process what was going on. I mean, when after the George Floyd murder, very quickly in Mississippi, you know, Black Lives Matter became activated. The legislature, you know, started feeling this pressure from the NCAA and from religious yeah. organizations. It was just like within a matter of days and weeks, it was the pressure was just so much that they had to do something about it. It um, it took me a while to sort of figure out what to do with that in the film and how to make it work, because partially it's. Um, it's, it, it's just so horrible that that's what starts the story and that's what causes the end of the story. Is yeah. Another African-American, you know, man being killed. Um, so those bookends, you know, it took me a long time to sort of figure out how, how can I make this story work um, just as a filmmaker um, structurally and, and make it work. But yeah, it's um, the, the George Floyd thing, you know, it's, we, we we shot the we we went out to the legislature as much as we could to try to capture that story. Yeah. Um. Uh. We went out to shoot the the Black Lives Matter in protest in Jackson, mm -hmm. and that was kind of the the moment where I realized that something was going to happen here because they 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 expected a few hundred people to be there, and there were thousands. Yeah. Thousands of people, um. And you could just feel that the energy there was was something to be reckoned with. And it was young people who were new to the to the fight, um, new voices. And it, for me, that's where I felt like something's going to happen here. There was a, a scene and I f forgot the politician that you interviewed, but he was talking about how and, and this was a talking point. A lot of people, a lot of politicians like to say, well, we voted on it in 2001. And I think what you saw in that Black Lives Matter protest and, you know, and I think about I've got a son who's who voted this time, who was one <laughs> when that vote happened. I mean, you have a whole new generation of people that see the world differently. So that that argument never really held a lot of water, but it seemed to it seemed to just suddenly dissolve instantly. Um, the 2001 vote didn't seem so binding on that. And, you know, looking back at 2001, you had the MEC, the Mississippi Economic Council, they, they were promoting changing it, the business community, there was some buy in on that. But this time, when you get the, when you get the faith based community behind you, that gives the legislators some, some cover. Yeah. Uh, and then you had the athletics, which you might as well speaking of, of religion, um, right. when you're not going to. So, I mean, it was just watching this perfect storm of, of, of things happen. And, and you even you could tell that there were certain politicians that were very reluctant to move on this, but they saw the handwriting on the wall and they did it anyway. Um, yeah. yeah, it was that was pretty powerful at that point. You, so, it, it, you know, there you're sitting there recording, trying to capture all this, hoping you're getting it all, I would imagine. Yeah. 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 And, you know, to your point, there's there's still, you know, there's a group of people who are still really upset about what happened. Um, and, and it's an organization called, I think they're called Let Mississippi Vote. And they are trying to gather signatures to put the flags back up for a vote. Yeah. And they feel like they were hoodwinked by uh, Governor Reeves, who had campaigned on, I'm not going to change this flag unless the people of Mississippi vote and change it. He succumbed to the pressure. And, you know, I have no idea where this will go, but there, there, there's a sizable number of folks who don't think this is over. Um, 
you know, and, and, and we'll see. But their their focus is you took our vote away. Yeah. These are people who are old enough to have voted, you know, back then, and they feel like, well, wait a minute, we voted in this. If we're gonna, if you're gonna change it, you gotta vote again. Um, so, you know, we'll we'll see where that goes. Um, but for some folks, I mean, for a lot of folks, it feels like it's over. Right. But there's a new flag, and you know, around where we live, I see it all over the place. I see it in places that didn't have a state flag flying at all now has this, you know, Magnolia themed flag flying, um, but not everyone's pleased. So the, you know, maybe, maybe there's a sequel <laughs> or, or, or part two, or I don't know, we'll, we'll see. Yeah, it, it was, um, it, it has been interesting. I, I think one of the places, if you're really curious about how mad people are, look at Governor Reeves's press conferences he, he holds in the afternoon on Facebook for okay. um, for uh, about the virus, about coronavirus. Right. There are people still bringing it up in that feed that are still mad at him over that thing. I, I kind of quipped that he's in flag jail a little bit on that politically, but I mean, that has to be a concern for him because that's his base, that's a big part of his base. And yeah, yeah, I, I don't claim to know the politics of it, you know, really very well, but folks who voted for him are really missed. Yeah. Uh, that that he that he you know that he caved is the way that they would probably put it and 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 change the flag just on his own basically. I thought that like for instance, I think the De Department of Archives and History did a very good job respectfully handling the the retiring of the old flag with the ceremony at the Capitol. All the statewide you know officials were there, were participating in that. They they give it an escort over to the museum. They they're going to have it. You know it's going to be displayed as a historical relic and all that. I mean, how important was that? You think in the potential healing process of? I, I, I think for people who are more in the middle and less of the partisan side. Yeah. Folks who are really adamant about keeping the flag, I don't think that really resonated with them a whole lot. I think they were maybe a little still stung by what happened. Yeah. And, but I think for people who were more in the middle and were maybe, you know, fatigued by the whole fight over the flag issue, yeah. were really happy to see the way the flag was uh, respectfully retired um, and it was given a tremendous dignity. And to this day, it's in the museum. Where a lot of people think it belongs, um, but you know, you know, the question about you know how many folks on the on the serious you know flag of 1894 side, I'm not sure how many people right. attended that, um, <laughs> you know, or feel like that was a, a you know. Well, they're they're probably upset the fact it came down at all. So yeah. at that point, yeah, yeah, you could you could have had an, a, an elephant parade with the flag on it and that wouldn't have made a difference on that. So. Yeah. yeah, but I, I think that the, the, the Mississippi Department of Archives and History folks really handled the, the entire uh, process of what was handed to them very well. Um, yeah. Again, I, I don't try to you know be too judgmental about anything, but I was impressed by the way that they managed to, you know, just put that whole thing together, get a, you know, get a flag design approved and yeah. You know, the whole thing, I give them credit for for taking that very seriously and taking their time and and uh, and seemingly making it work. Yeah, I was glad that they that they tapped Reuben Anderson to, to do what he did. Um, he has an awful lot of credibility in the state of Mississippi and, and many different levels. And, and like you said, I think that process came out and, and and it is nice. It is nice to see our flag back up like in Washington and so forth, you, you know, at the, at, the, at the U.S. Capitol or you see it. You know, I mean, you're seeing more of them around so forth. And, and the new flags, you know, it won by 70 percent in the referendum. So it, it seemed to be fairly popular. Yeah. And that, I wouldn't say I was surprised by that. But a lot of people told me a lot of people who I think, you know, sort of know the state pretty well, thought it had no chance of winning. Really? I, so, I, yeah. And I, I can't exactly recall why, but um, I was a, a little surprised. Uh, you know, the next day or that night when we saw what those numbers were, that it was pretty, it was basically a, a reverse of what it was in 2001. Yeah. You know, it was 65-35 in 2001, and this was 70-30, I think, roughly. Um, and I think a, a lot of that, if I had to guess, was was fatigue. Yeah. I think I think people were just tired of, uh, of fighting over it. Yeah. Uh, you know, that, that might be it.
I mean, there, there's this, I guess, the cynic in me, you know, you, you think we spent all this energy for all these years fighting to, to, to do this. And, and I'm not saying it should have stayed. I'm just saying, but, you know, we, we focus over here and then there's so many problems over here. Like I said, sometimes we like shiny things to. to oh, yeah. I, I heard that you know fairly regularly. Why are you making something about the flag? We've got so many other issues to deal with. Yeah, but nobody wants to deal with those either. So. <laughs> no. Yeah. No. Yeah. Like I gotta make what I'm gonna make, you know. We'll right. No, that that's I'll put the camera those other things next time. Yeah, exactly. Well, I was just always funny. I always find it funny when people say that to me, and then they're like, "Well, but we're not gonna mess with doing the other things right now, dude. That's yeah. too hard." I, yeah. I really, you know, on the process of doing it, and of course, um, I, I noticed that that Margaret is a producer on that, so it's it's nice mm -hmm. that she got to you, you got to work together a little bit on the project. I know that was fun. Yeah. When how do you, I mean, just on the nuts and bolts of doing a documentary and how did, I mean, how do you fund it? How do you figure out, you know, the schedule on it? How do you get people to help on it? There's, there's so many moving pieces to putting something to this scale. I mean, I put together a five minute video for my son for class and, and it wears me out, you know, it's, it takes me forever to edit something. So there was a lot of time and energy put into this. Tell us a little bit about the nuts and bolts of this. Um, in terms of funding, it's self-funded. You know, oh. we we did apply for you know every conceivable grant, you know, through Sundance and other film yeah. festivals and other granting organizations. But the competition for those is you know incredible. Um, so you know, you know, I funded the film um, over these five years. In terms of you know the nuts and bolts of it, 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 you know, it's a little bit more difficult in Mississippi than say if you live in Chicago or New York or Los Angeles in terms of finding, you know, people who, you know, are editors and cinematographers and yeah. you know, all these folks. But I was able to, to locate some people who, you know, were good camera folks. And the scheduling was really driven by what's going on. Yeah. Um, you know, it's like if there's a rally here, I got to get over there. I got to find someone to help shoot it. I ended up shooting a lot of it myself for that reason. So maybe 50% of the film that you see is was me by myself with a camera. So you wore out the car. <laughs> yeah, you, you throw yeah. it in the car and you go. You know, yeah. something quickly happens. Um, and then you know the 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 other end of, end of it is is an, you know working with an editor. And yeah. I've got a relationship with an organization up in Chicago called Cartempwin, mm -hmm. and it's a well known documentary production house. And sort of through a connection there, I was connected to a, a guy named Matt Lauterbach, who's an editor, and we work remotely. Um, for the most part, so that he'd get footage and he'd get transcripts and he, you know, you know, we talk about it and then he cut a scene. He did spend some time here in Mississippi, he'd come work with me here in my office, you know, for a few days at a time. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a messy, it's a messy process, especially, as you said, when you're trying to capture something in real time, when we don't know what's going to happen. Right. So you just, you just have to be as flexible as you can. You've got to be committed to going, you know, there's a sort of saying in documentary film, if you don't go shoot something, that's when something happens. Right. So you have to sort of force yourself. If there's something happening, go do it. And then in terms of the interviews with folks, you know, it's, I, you know, emails, phone calls, mm -hmm. you know, would you be willing to talk? You know, when can you talk? And you set up a time and you go do it. Um, but I think it's, it's a, this was a particularly messy process. And I've always had in the back of my head that the film, I could allow the film to be kind of messy because that's what it was. Right. <laughs> you know, narratively, it's a little disjointed, but. You but know. I think it works. I mean, like I said, the whole process was disjointed. So, I mean, I think it, it captures the whole, you know, what happened in the last five to six years very well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks. Appreciate it. You know, I, I, I think about that. I was just thinking, yeah, I guess Ken Burns didn't have to worry about Teddy Roosevelt coming back to life. And, uh, you know, uh, you know, that's that's the difference. Yeah, that's entirely true. Everything he does is a, is a look backwards. And he always connects right. with what's going on in the present tense. Um, and, and I have thought to myself a couple of times in the last year that I'm, I'm also working on another film right now that's a healthcare themed film. I've been working on it for maybe a little over three years. And yeah. it's also a case of I'm following a story as it plays out. I don't know where it's going to go. I don't know how long it's going to take. But in the back of my mind, I'm thinking that when the look away, look away is done, done in terms of the distribution and all the work yeah. that's all there, my next project is not going to be a contemporary 
let's see what happens and see if it's interesting <laughs> story. I'm going to find something that happened and we know what happened and then we're going to examine it. Yeah, it's uh, you're going to do one on the on the pandemic. <laughs> Because you know how that's going to end, right? You know, it's like, yeah, yeah. I think there's enough pandemic work being done right now. I'm not sure. I could imagine. I could imagine on that. No, you talk about distribution, and well, I mean, we're getting close, bumping up toward the end, I guess. But uh, you talk about distribution on this. How does that work for an independent documentary to be able to get it in front of people? And who's going to see it? Is it something that you hope ends up on Netflix or on on one of the streaming services, or do you show it at festivals? What's the process? That's the the, the pandemic itself has turned that whole world upside down. The yeah. traditional path for a film like this is a year of film festivals where you know you get the film out in front of audiences, live audiences, you get reviews, you get buzz, you get people talking about it if it's a good film, and that gets the attention of, or allows you to get the attention of distributors. Yeah. Uh, uh, in the case of The Invisible Patients, my previous film, um, someone at PBS sort of had gotten, you know, wind of it and reached out to me and we ended up having a, a premiere or not a, a broadcast, an actual broadcast on America Reframed. Yeah. And now that film is in distribution primarily with educational uh, film, okay. film um, companies. With this one, it's it's going to be a little bit different. They're, the festivals are sort of operating in a different way. Yeah. Um, the other issue is that during the year of pandemic, a lot of people finished films but didn't release them. Oh, so there's a glut of films. There will be a glut of films. Um, so I'm, you know, sort of constantly trying to, you know, and I have been in touch with a lot of distribution people who are aware of the film, yeah. but I don't know what's going to happen. So mm -hmm. this premiere, this this the screening in Oxford is the film's premiere. Okay. So we'll see where that goes and we'll see what happens and and uh, with any luck it'll be it'll be shown to wider audiences as we move for as we move along. Yeah, who's your dream audience for this? I mean, who who do you who would you want to see it? Oh boy, that's a good question. I mean, the broad answer is anybody who's interested in sort of, you know, how conflict is resolved, people are interested in history, people are interested in political science. Um, if it could if it could land on a plate in a place like Netflix, that'd be great. I mean that that's a pretty high bar these days. Yeah. Um, but you know, folks who folks who also and also folks who have a stake in the debate, yeah, you know, people who have thought about this for a long time, uh, you know, and maybe haven't gotten all the historical context, because um, there's a lot of historical context that once you know some of these historical uh, facts, it, it might change the way you think about it a little bit. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's it's um, that's a tough that's a tough question to your audiences. Yeah, I, I thought, well, once again, I think you did a really good job letting people speak what was on their mind, what they were, what they believed, but then you backed it up with the facts, like you said, that, it, you know, I mean, that helped to just maybe make what they were saying, maybe not have as much validity as maybe they thought, but I mean, that, but I think you did it in a very fair way. And mm -hmm. that, and it, I don't, it wasn't like some kind of hit job on the thing, but I mean, if people look bad, it was just because of what they did or said on that. But I, I, I felt like you did a great job historically laying out the case for changing the flag, even though you were pretty much, you know, just yeah. laying out what happened. Yeah, I mean, part of that is, I think, and it's one of the reasons that, you know, the, the film, we use these sort of quotations throughout. Yeah, um, that are just used to just make you think about what you're going to see a little bit differently. And the first quotation on the film is something to the effect. Um, oh, I've got it right here. The um, essence of a nation is that all the individuals have many things in common and that they may they have forgotten many things. Ernest Renan. Right. So this notion that, you know, we collectively forget stuff and there's yeah. a kind of a reason for it. Right. And, you know, if you know, if we as a, as a northerner, as a, you know, I grew up in Chicago. I never thought about racism, and you know, I, I obviously thought about racism in the Chicago area we grew up. But I never really thought about what was going on during the Civil War in Illinois. Illinois yeah. has a very dark racist past. Then you couldn't be a, a free black person in Illinois; they wouldn't let you in. You yeah. Know? So northerners, we don't think about that anymore. Yeah. Because we won the war. I think that's why we don't think about it. But this notion that we tend to forget the unpleasant stuff so we can move forward, my feeling is that stuff comes up and bites you if you don't if you don't know it. There's there's a lot of it's a lot of stuff around the Civil War that you know most people just don't know. 
155, 100, you know, 56 years later, we're still, you know, yeah. Yeah. debating so it. We, we, I felt it was important that we could give as much context as, as, you know, seemed appropriate for a film like this to let you think, okay, back then, this is what people were thinking. Yeah. And, and there's a reason why we're where we are today. Well, I thought it was really good too that you had the 1890 uh, Constitutional Convention talking about that, obviously, because that, I mean, that, because obviously our constitution is from that point, but also too, uh, that was when Jim Crow was was basically born. That's, you know, so it really did give 1894, that number for the flag, a lot more context, understanding yeah. what was going on in the world when the flag was born. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a, a document, it's the, um, it's basically the, the notes from that constitutional convention, it's like 300 pages long of just what all the legislators were trying to do and what speeches yeah. were made is mind boggling. Um, if you want to get a taste of what people were thinking in Mississippi in 1890, <laughs> read that document. It's uh, it's 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 uh, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, you had some of those quotes in the in the in the film, and I was just like, well, you know, don't don't mince words. <laughs> you know, just go yeah, ahead. Exactly. They, they vomited said, on out there. A lot of them said what that was on their minds, and it doesn't hold up real well. <laughs> Yeah, you had another. You showed another quote. It's from Lewis, and I can't remember his last name because I didn't write it down. But it is it is the battle lost, not the battle won, that clings to the mind. Yeah, I mean, that, I, I have, that is so true. Yeah, I, I, right. have a, I have a um, a great great grandfather who fought for the Union Army in my family. None of my family has ever given that two thoughts until very yeah. recently because of this film. It's because you know we moved on. Yeah, you know. But if you lose, it's it stings a little more. I think. I had, I had two, I had, you know, relatives that fought on both sides, like a lot of people. And I'm, my family's from East Tennessee. So that was, it was just kind of a weird part of the world. Most of them were Scotch Irish and they didn't really care anyway. They were just busy being mad. But my great, great grandfather fought in, in the Union Army. And I have one that fought in the Confederate Army, but, it, and, and I've got his medals sitting over here up on the, on the bookshelf that somehow got passed down to me. Uh -huh. But my, my one here, he became a circuit rider in North Mississippi after the war and hung out here. And I've got uh -huh. his biography talking about how, you know, people liked him, even though he ministered to Republicans and, and to Negroes. And that was that was his words on that. And then at one point he had to leave leave the state because he was about to get strung up and he had to get out. But he came back and, you know, and my great, you know, but so it's it's so fascinating when you start looking back at your family on that. But. Yeah. But like I said, I, I felt like that, you know, with the documentary did a good job, not only telling the history, but talking about the relevance today and, and why it means so much to people and why it hurts so many people the way it does. And uh, it was great. So thank you. I appreciate, I appreciate that. Yeah. I appreciate and I appreciate this conversation too. You got any last thoughts before I let you go and start working on yet another wonderful documentary, you know? No, I mean, just I can plug the Oxford Film Festival. It's going to, if you're in Oxford, the screen will, the film will screen on Saturday, March 27th. And then after that, starting April 1st, it's available for one week online, only for people in Mississippi. Oh, wow. Okay. Through the festival, you can get online and watch it for that week, uh, you know, on your laptop or your home, your, your television at home. Yeah, make sure you, you let me have that link and I will get it in on this, on this uh, on this page for this so that people can make sure that they can see it so they can make comments and judge for themselves. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Pat enjoyed it. I can't wait till um, I guess now I'm, we're all getting vaccinated and everything so I can head back down your way again. Yeah. Well, we'd love to have you here. I know. I, I was so envious of you. I, I drove down for to go speak at the library and I'm sitting here looking around taking pictures because it's so, so pretty. And you know, I had done a lot of work after Katrina and past Christiane. So, I mean, I have a very uh, special, it's a special place in my heart. Did yeah. a lot of cleaning up houses and, and, and removing debris and stuff. And I'm taking a picture of the sunset and, and you and Margaret just come just riding up. It's like, okay, I hate yeah. you. All. <laughs> this is, this is one. I'm so jealous that y'all can hate us for that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know, but next time there's a bad storm, I'll think, oh my God, I hope they're okay. But at, at that yeah. moment, it was just like, you've got, we're really lucky life. here. Yeah. yeah. We're really lucky. It's a beautiful place. I mean, that's the thing about Mississippi. And, and like I said, I think probably a good thing to um, to end on. I mean, like I said, I, I never thought when I moved here that I would be here for more than maybe two years. And I've been here for 25 years, raised three boys here and and absolutely love the state. And I think for me personally, uh, just on the editorial side of this, 
you know, that's what hurt about the, 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 the fight over this, because at the end of the day, I just want the best for, I want Mississippi's best foot to always show because I think there is so much good here to yeah. show. Yeah, no, I, I love being here too. Margaret and I both do. We feel pretty lucky to be where we are. And it's, for me, it's, it's just been fun to be in a place that, you know, every, every day I'm learning something new. You yeah. Know? It's, it's a, it's a, you know, I'm, I'm from the North and I'm learning something about the South. Well, according to the the lady I spoke to that time who said I was a Yankee, I guess I am too, even though I'm from Atlanta. So <laughs> I still okay. laugh about that one. Yeah, so, hey, I want to say thank you. And um, we'll have to do this again sometime. Really. Yeah, really let's good. do it. Let's uh, appreciate right. it. We'll see you All later. Right. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay.